please if you have any problems and any concern about that turn off your camera and let us know okay i think we are ready to go so i think i will start sharing my screen this way okay are you capable of see something okay so let's move on uh, this is the second workshop uh, of uh, the climate data series which is part of the distributed design project which is has been founded by creative europe which is a platform that acts as an exchange for talents to network and share skills and practices. Today's agenda uh, will cover those points, these points, maybe a brief introduction, and then we are going to talk about the field of data sonification. We are going to examine how data sonification is and when is used, and also some particular techniques. And then we are going to cover some basic concept uh, of the super collider tool that we are going to use today later in the, in the course of the day um, we are going to cover some basic concept uh, about uh, uh, sound synthesis and also we are going to apply uh, eventually the concept of data sonification using super collider as a tool mm, please let me know if something that i will tell will be not clear to you uh, stop me and ask. I will be glad to answer your questions. So, let me introduce uh, us. Here we are in OpenDot, which is an open innovation hub, a place for learning, prototyping, and also sharing knowledge. OpenDot is also a fab lab and is located in Milan. OpenDot was founded in uh, 2014 by DotaDot, which is a multidisciplinary design studio based in Milan uh, and it was also the first in Italy, one of the first studios in the design and interaction field. Uh, also I would like to tell you who I am. I am, a, as I told you before, a developer and also a sound designer and here at the dot I'm responsible for all the uh, electronics and firmware setup of our interactive installations and also I work uh, uh, in sound uh, creating sound experiences talking uh, and working with concepts like generative music procedural sound specialization and so on I would like also to um, uh, proceed turning it over to you in order for you to introduce yourself very briefly I would like you to tell me who you are and what you're about and what's your interest in taking part in this workshop today I would like to start maybe from one of you let's start with Martin Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Martin. Hi, I'm from the south of Germany. Uh, I'm an interaction designer. Uh, I work in, um, in UX design specifically uh, for a company who is um, working in insurance and finance uh, software. So it's not so, not that fancy like the uh, stuff you showed. <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, um, also, I have been working in. Um, in the field of exhibition and spatial communication. So that, that is something, um, the, especially data sonification is something I'm very interested in, also in terms of um, accessibility, maybe even for usage in a um, software surrounding. Let's see, I think cool. it's an interesting concept. Thank you for having me. Thank you to you. Let's move on. Uh, please, Martin, select one of your choice. Um, I'm seeing Gregorio. How about you? Gregorio? 
would you like to tell us something about you? Hi, hi everybody. Uh, hi. My name is Gregorio. I'm from Florence in Italy. I'm, uh, I'm a musician and uh, developers and um, I'm graduated from the Conservatory of Florence uh, in uh, electronic music uh, with a thesis on the uh, uh, sonification of big data sets. And my interest is, is uh, in sonification and more in general in auditory display work. Okay, cool. Very cool, thank you for sharing. Let's move on. I can choose someone else. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay, uh, Luca. Hey, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Luca. I'm based in Turin. I'm 23 years old, and um, I work as a filmmaker and as a UX UI designer. And um, in the last few months, I started looking a lot into data visualization and studying that field. So. When I saw this workshop, I, I decided to attend because it's a lot about data and uh, it's another way to visualize data. So uh, I'm really curious about that. Thank you, cool. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to choose uh, Tiziano. Hi, I'm a colleague of uh, Nicola. I'm working in the Fab Lab. So I normally use CNC machines and 3D printers. I don't have any background in music actually, but I'm interested in producing sounds from electronics mainly as a debugging tool. So when you hear a noise from a machine that is not working, you know it's not working and I want to do that for electronic. Um, I can choose Julia. Not answering or Angles. Hi, uh, I'm Julia, and I'm actually Hi, working at dot dot dot. Uh, I'm taking a stage here, an internship for this period, so I'm learning what they're doing uh, in the studio. And I'm choosing uh, Chiara. So hi to everybody, uh, I'm Chiara. I'm a digital and interaction design student at Politecnico di Milano. And uh, the reason why I'm here now is because uh, uh, I'm quite interested in data. So from a few years, uh, like I graduate uh, from my bachelor with a thesis on uh, human data, but uh, also in uh, the generative approach, I've uh, just and only work visually. So collecting data and uh, visualize them, but I never work with sound. And uh, I'm really interested uh, in uh, what I can do with them also, the sound approach. So here I am. And um, Thank you. maybe Elisa? Hi, I'm Elisa, software developer, data analyst. I have a little company here in Italy and a non-profit association that work with contemporary artists combining art, performance, and technologies, uh, data, software, and so. And so I think this workshop could be very useful for my job, for my interest, uh, so. Thank you, Elisa. And now, Mirko. Hi, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mirko, and uh, I work uh, in this fab lab in uh, Castelfranco Veneto. And um, as you can see in the background, not the fake background <laughs> here. Uh, yes, I'm interested on the open data and big data, and also on this side of the data, the data sonification. Uh, I played the guitar and trumpet uh, for a lot of years when I was a teenager, so I know something about music, but nothing about uh, uh, sound generation. So I'm really interested on uh, this topic. And um, I choose uh, Aina, Ina, sorry, Clara. Hi, hi. hi. Uh, I, I'm, Ina. I'm also from the south of Germany. Um, I think where Martin is from, actually. And I'm an interaction design student in my fourth semester now. And I'm interested in like data and how to visualize different types of data. And I'm excited to see 
what I will learn today. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Thank you to you. Um, I will choose who didn't go yet. Uh, Simone. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, also a colleague of Nicola here from Milan and a developer in Dot Dot Dot. Uh, so who haven't uh, introduced himself yet? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe uh, all of us uh, has, have introduced uh, themselves. Maybe we can start. I don't know. I think that at least the most part of us have introduced uh, themselves. Other people that you're seeing here in chat are also my, the colleague of mine. So uh, is is uh, enough to know that they work with me and with Tiziana and with Simone. So I think that we can start the real thing. Okay. Are you still capable of hearing my voice? Okay. So uh, the first question I think is what the data sonification is. I would like to use the same exact word of uh, uh, Anna Davis, which is a generative music composer and also an independent researcher in New York. She worked in the fields of machine learning and also natural language processing and data-driven music composition. Uh, her words are the, the one you see here. Data sonification is quite the same thing as data visualization. Um, I think that all of us have a little or maybe great experience with data visualization. The things is that in data sonification, we use sound to represent data instead of visual. This seems to be quite intuitive, right? But also we can start thinking about data sonification and uh, uh, why it can be useful and what's, uh, what are the application of data sonification. Um, just to mention a few of them, we can think about data sonification to be a useful tool in research field because sometimes sound is a great uh, instrument, great tool to condense a great, uh, a huge amount of data in a little space in time, I mean. And also condensing data in a short amount of time can be uh, very interesting because we are taking advantage of the fact that the hear is uh, faster than the eyes in collecting uh, information from the outside as a sensory um, tool and uh, uh, condensing information in a short amount of, ta of time is also a good way to learn and to search and look for patterns inside data, patterns that we are not able to see simply looking at data in their tabular form. I mean. And also um, the same things can be said for finding anomalies inside data because translating data into sound, uh, we can uh, very fast find something that is going wrong in our data or something that is uh, very different from the data we have already uh, listened to. Uh, we can also tell, uh, tell something about process monitoring. Tiziano before uh, told us that sound can also be a good debug tool to see if a machine is doing its job well. Um, this is, in fact, a uh, field of application of data sonification. Uh, another can be um, for monitoring web traffic on a server, and, and uh, you can uh, instantan instantaneously uh, hear when things are going wrong because of a, a great number of uh, uh, requests from clients because the sounds is becoming more uh, frenetic or something like that. Also, sounds can be uh, a tool uh, to be used in, uh, um, in addition to other uh, tools that we are already using. I mean, you can use your ears while you are using your eyes. So sounds can be used side by side uh, to other kind of uh, um, maybe visualization and to add more meanings and extract maybe uh, more interesting information from the data. 
also it can be used in all the situation where you have a person with difficulties in uh, looking at things and using their eyes to grab information from uh, from the data but also uh, you can think about data sonification as a way of transfer meanings and also emotion because sounds is something that we are uh, used to when we talk about uh, yes music of course but also uh, score in, in films and so on so we can use all these uh, kind of uh, particular things uh, related to sound to convey uh, in a better way, the emotion and the, uh, the information. And many more, of course, these are only a few of them. But because we are talking of sound and we are trying to find a way to convey information using sound, we, all, we have also to uh, understand what sound is and also uh, what we are going to see now are things that we are going to use also later when we are going to talk about super collider. Sound we know it is a multidimensional phenomenon and we can look at it uh, at least from two point of views, different point of views. The physical one, which is the physical domain, which is related to all the physical aspect of sound, amplitude, frequency and so on, but also under the light of the perceptual domain because our ears collect the vibration and also translate into electrical stimuli that is going inside our brain and our brain is interpreting them and also is giving them some kind of meaning that we are used to. Uh, we are not mentioning uh, the cultural and also social aspect of sound in terms of music coming from different cultures with different kind of uh, uses. And uh, at least we are gonna see some of those physical aspects of the sound. For example, uh, the most important of those sound dimension, or maybe if you want audio features, is the amplitude, the volume. We are all familiar with this. Sound is energy, and the greater the energy uh, is transferred, also the greater is the volume of the sound that we perceive, which uh, has a physical domain counterpart, which is called amplitude. But also sound exists because of time, because sound is a phenomenon that is, uh, that is evolving uh, in time. And so we have sound with different duration. We are capable of distinguish different sound according to uh, the, time they, the, the time they last. I don't know if you can hear. Okay, so the first example and the second one. I think that everybody is capable of distinguish them uh, thanks to the different duration of the sound. On the x-axis we have time and amplitude on the y-axis. There are sounds that are not capable to last for a long time because of the physical characteristic of the object that is producing it. We have also sounds that can produce continuous sound like the second one which is a clarinet and that's why we can also differentiate sound not only by uh, their duration but only but also with the uh, evolution of the amplitude with the passing of time for example the first is a percussive sound so we can try to trace uh, the, this, uh, uh, this line uh, on the contours of the amplitude which is called envelope you can clearly see that we have two distinct phases. The first one going from zero to the maximum amplitude and then going back to zero. Uh, those phases are called attack, attack and release. Uh, when we are talking about a sustained sound, we have some kind of different envelope. You see that there's also a sort of horizontal line where the amplitude is not varying very much. This is the sustained phase. Uh, the attack is always here. We have a little decay and then the amplitude stay fixed, almost fixed for a, a very long amount of time. And then we have uh, our release again. So we can also examine sound under another point of view, not talking about time anymore. 
but we can talk about space, we know that if we look at the space around us using our eyes, we are always looking at a small amount of space, while with our ears we can look all around us, because ears are um, sensory are sensors that are not segregating our perception in a physical position in space. Also, thanks to our um, thinness, the sound that is coming from all the direction is also enriched with specific sound cue that our brain is capable of interpreting and also finding very quickly what is the direction the sound is coming from. And also, this is a way uh, that we can use uh, to discriminate different uh, source position. We have talked uh, of space, but we can talk also of uh, vibration. So we have said that sound is uh, is energy. Sound is uh, evolving uh, during time, but we know that our uh, sensory systems is capable of uh, understanding and working with all the possible vibrations, not all the possible one, yes, of course, but uh, all the vibration that are inside our audible uh, range. And here we have two different examples. We can also differentiate from the first one, I wish this is not too loud. And the second one. Those are both sound evolving in time, but as you see, the first one has all of its energy distributed in all the available uh, vibrations. And that's why we call these, we perceive these as a noisy sounds, or if you want, an aperiodic sound. But if energy of these sounds are condensed, uh, if, you, if you want, or maybe are concentrated in particular, uh, vibration and also vibration that uh, have a particular um, correlation one with the other, we perceive uh, the sound to be a pitch, a pitchy sound, a periodic one. This is another cue for us to differentiate between different sound stimulus. Let's go on because when we talk about energy distributed in all the vibration, we are always talking about spectrum. Those, these are three different examples of different sounds, uh, but I think that you will be able to differentiate them. Let's start by hearing the first one, as we already know it. There's something similar between all of them. I think that everybody is capable to tell this. Those are all uh, instruments that are playing the same exact note, uh, but we are quite uh, good at finding that these are three different musical instruments. That's because they have a different spectrum, different timber because energy is distributed in different spaces, in different places on those vibrations, and we are quite good at differentiated sound uh, this way. Let's move on, let me see. Okay, cool. Uh, and now that we have uh, covered all the uh, part related to the physics domain of sound, we can start uh, seeing some uh, data sonification technique. We are going to cover the principal data sonification methods. The first one is the odification is called. Then we are going to cover the parameter mapping sonification and so on with the model based. And then we are going to cover briefly ear cones and auditory icons. Modification is the most simple way of turning your data into sound and is often used as the first way of investigating a new area, is the first approach, and consists of directly mapping your raw data directly into sound. 
they have to be data moving around uh, an equilibrium point and also they should be monodimensional uh, and the data should be converted directly uh, into amplitude maybe you also need to make some transformation on the data maybe changing uh, and compressing those data in time uh, and also maybe translate those data inside the perceptual uh, range audible range for human ears and so on but i think it will be more clear uh, using some example so let's go on let's move to this one which is also uh, an example of the concept of compression those are data recorded from different seismic stations in japan uh, this is an earthquake and the sound of two days of data um, is created by the compression of those data by a factor of uh, 1440 i mean uh, two days of data are turned into two minutes of sound i try to play it are you capable of hearing something yes prepare for the big crash example of data compression so two days of seismic data recorded by those stations are turned into sound directly mapping the way those sensors are moving uh, around their equilibrium point to amplitude and uh, it's quite interesting to me that this data is quite similar uh, even if it is coming from the earth it's quite similar to a thunder it's quite similar to other sound that we can hear in nature another example of Audification can be uh, this one. Let me see. This is another example that I think is directly connected with our own experience. I think that we can hear it in order to understand what in what I mean. Yes, in fact, this is the uh, direct, direct conversion of the electrical signal that um, a 56K modem uh, is sending through the telephone lines, directly connecting them to, to produce sound. In fact, those uh, technology devices, those modems, uh, had actually a, a little speaker inside them in order for the user to directly debug what is going on in the telephone and internet connection. This is kind of audification if you want. So I think that we can move on to the another uh, technique that to me is the uh, most interesting one uh, and also um, I think one of them more complicated because here we have to deal with the data um, all the data we can we should we have to understand how our data are uh, are cre have been created and recorded and we can try to uh, map them to uh, particular particular auditory values in order to uh, highlight specific uh, things inside our database uh, we can turn back to our sound domain. We know that we have a lot uh, of uh, elements that we can work with when we talk about audio. So you can see, yes, of course, amplitude, spectrum, and time duration, but also data 
are uh, can be very different and we have also a lot of um, qualities i mean data can be qualitative data they can uh, be in form of label maybe strings also categories but also data can be in a numerical form uh, quantitative let's say they can be integers floats but also data can be related to time because they have time tags also they can be uh, georeferenced so they can be they can have they can be related to a position in space they also can be maybe let's say in a boolean form they can be true false and so on so when we try to create a sonification in the parameter uh, parametric way we are always trying to find some kind of relation between the data domain and the data features and the sound features by means of creating those mapping functions which can help us to move the information contained inside the data to uh, interesting uh, parameter of sound in order to translate uh, the meaning contained inside data also uh, in sound. This is an iterative process. I mean that it is not linear because we have always to listen to our result and maybe turn back uh, in a process that is continuous of uh, fine-tuning all those mapping functions and also requires us maybe to prepare data many times and also make uh, uh, different steps in creating those mapping functions. As you see, I have used this image because here we have three different ways those mapping functions are represented. The first one is the one-to-one, -one, uh, the one we use when we directly map uh, one dimension of the data set to one dimension inside the audio features but we cannot we are free also to maybe map uh, a variation in data to many uh, sound parameters the contrary is also real because we can take many uh, di uh, dimensions from the data and also turn them uh, to act on a single parameter uh, in the sound synthesis. Uh, let's move on because I would like to show you some example of this. Yes, this is also coming from our everyday experience. I think that is absolutely not uh, new to you. This is uh, an example of parameter uh, sonification, parameter mapping sonification, where a distance is pay in space is translated in distance in time, and the, uh, among all of these sound impulses, um, then we can move on to maybe a more complex example, which is taken from a work of uh, the guys, uh, the sound, the system sound guys. They were asked to, uh, by NASA to create a sonification uh, for the 15th anniversary of the first moon landing. So they created a data set composed of uh, a number of occurrences of certain keywords um, within the scientific production, let's say in articles, citation and patents. Keywords like uh, Apollo, Apollo samples, Apollo images and they turned the number of uh, the quantity of keyboards to the pitch of particular musical instrument uh, and they also added a time dimension uh, you will see it scrolling from uh, right to left uh, where every month every year and also every rocket launches is uh, underlined with a particular sound. We can try to listen to it. Uh. 
But why some say the moon? 11, 10, 10, Why choose this as our goal? The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. Lift off. Lift off. We have lift off. We And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? All of us. Tower clear. Speed 2,495 feet per second. Why does Rice play Texas? Okay, we just lost the platform. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world dropped We choose to go to the moon. The Armstrong reporting number one pitch program, which pitch upon it. We choose to go to the moon. And now more keywords will be we inserted. We will see. In this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy. It's like a, it's like a very <laughs> but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are willing to postpone. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And one we intend to win. I have a beautiful radio. It has a dark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of the uh, United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Have you been able to hear the movement of the different uh, musical instrument? They or they uh, moved in pitch according to the quantity of those keywords, and they added also different keywords in later on on the piece to uh, talk about other different uh, lunar missions. So. Now that we have talked about the, par the parameter uh, mapping sonification, we can take a look briefly to other uh, uh, data sonification techniques. This one, for example, those last three techniques are uh, kind of related, uh, very re uh, related to the user interactions. I mean, taking, uh, for example, this model-based sonification takes uh, inspiration from the real way uh, the the everyday uh, objects uh, produce sounds. When we have an object and we put an excitation over it, it vibrates and also it produces sounds that will be will reach our ears. So we can try to do quite the same things in taking our data set and use those data points to create some sort of structure. It not it. Uh, um, can also uh, be a 3D structure, let's say, uh, always virtual, and we can add energy inside this model in a specific point, and we can listen to the sound in order to examine our data set by means of uh, listening to the various uh, kind of sound this object will, uh, will produce. Let's do an example of this to make it easy to understand. Let's say that we have a uh, data set made like this. Uh, th this data set can, be, can have many dimensions. Let's take, for example, uh, this could be a data set uh, about uh, uh, our account on Facebook and all the connection we have with our friends and also our friends, the way they are connected to, uh, to, the, to others and so on. So maybe there's someone that has a uh, few connections on the net and maybe uh, some other user will have a lot of connections. So uh, if we take also 
some of those data points and we connect them together with those edges, we are creating a sort of structure. We can also, according to the data and the relation between them, we can also characterize every neuron, every data point with two different functions, which are functions used to describe the way energy will go through the model, uh, through the edges. And then if a node has a lot of connection, the stiffness of the node, or in other terms, the resistance the node will have in moving around its equilibrium point will be stronger than in other places in our model. So if we inject uh, excitation inside the model, we can clearly examine our data by simply hearing uh, the way the sound, the, the model is sounding in different points, in different positions. I mean, that's a way to examine the data from a qualitative perspective in a way to understand how many connections that we have, how many the data can be clusterized and so on. Another example of interactive uh, of data sonification is coming from the sonification of data acquired from the human interaction from a different perspective. For example, Auditory icons was uh, a method to uh, sonify everyday experience with a, a graphical user interface uh, with sound uh, coming from our uh, everyday experience. This is quite an interesting example. I would like to show you maybe only, uh, only a brief portion of it. Let me see if I'm capable. You can hear it. Let me see. And this is okay. the Sonic Finder, which is a prototype auditory interface that I developed. And in this interface, many of the events, selecting objects in the Sonic Finder make sounds. And those sounds depend on the type of objects, so that folders make one sort of sounds, applications a second, files a third, and disks yet another sound. The sounds also depend on the object size, so that small objects, like this small folder, make higher sounds than large objects, like this large folder. And that principle continues through to applications, files, and so on. Disks make sounds that depend on how much room they have left. So this floppy disk, which doesn't, can't contain too much more information, makes a higher sound than this hard disk. In this way, I get immediate feedback from selecting objects, and sounds also provide information about the object's sizes and their types. Now we'll look at ways that sound provides other sorts of information in this interface. Now the interesting thing to me when is the way uh, object, object is the way the copy, copy file is working. When Let's I hit a it. container, like a folder, a disk, or the trash can. This helps me avoid the common mistake of either missing a target or inadvertently dropping an object into a container. Like the visual icons, the sounds used in this interface are meant to build upon people's experience with the everyday world. For instance, when I open a window and scroll down it, the sound lets me know very easily whether I'm near the top or the bottom. This one is good to me. When I copy a file, and also this one. the pouring sound makes it very clear how far the copy has progressed and when it's done. And since I don't want the copy, I can drag it to the trash can and throw it in and know that it's gone. Very cool to me the way that uh, files are copied from a place to the other, the way it is sonified, the progression bar. Uh, I think I don't know if I uh, if I if I will be capable of uh, having all those sounds in my today experience with my computer. But if you think about it, 
is there something that is still remaining today like this one that is coming directly from this kind of experiments uh, the ear cones is something similar to me uh, but different in some uh, in some way because if we are using sound from the everyday experience when we talk about auditory icons when we talk about ear cones is more like talking uh, uh, of uh, musical light motif uh, as when we listen to the Sergei Prokofiev let's say uh, Peter and the Wolf where each character has its own musical characterization so for the user perspective uh, the one who is listening to the music is always um, capable of telling oh now it's coming Peter now it's coming the Wolf and ear cones is something like that first you have to learn the connection between the uh, musical phrase and its meaning but then com combining those phrases all together you can uh, tell quite easy what is going on or you on your interface so if we are listening to this we are not capable of telling what is happening but if uh, after using it many times we get used to action like open maybe print copy and also we can differentiate between file folder and application we can quite easy tell what this means this is quite an esoteric experiment to me but is uh, it, it can be useful in some context where maybe you are not capable of seeing anything from an, inter an interface the interface doesn't have a screen you should understand only by your ear what it, it is what is happening and uh, I think this can be a very interesting way of thinking about sonifying data in a different way so let me see oh yes I will go through very quick uh, on those other elements, on those other examples, because we can talk about examples that are not so related to the scientific way of approaching data, like the first we have seen. Now we can talk about some more artistic experiment, where if you want, uh, we don't have maybe. Uh, data that drives components or maybe uh, we have a little connection between data and, uh, and, and the sound but the very important aspect here is to um, focus on the experience uh, what we hear should be interesting and also uh, should be um, uh, good to listen to uh, so that's why we can uh, maybe not concentrate uh, so much to the connection to the data also those works uh, as very complex mapping and also very indirect mapping to the data for example this is a work uh, by Anna Davis which is the girl we talked about uh, when we talk of the about the data sonification um, definition her work in uh, with the software transpose uh, was focused on translating emotions coming from novels to obtain musical uh, pieces that is also transferring by hearing uh, to them the same kind of emotion of the one that you are experiencing when reading those novels this is quite interesting to me Let's hear only this example that is taken from Heart of Darkness. Do you know it is the novel that is, has been used to create uh, Apocalypse Now?
it's quite interesting to make a comparison between Heart of Darkness and Peter Pan, but I will let you explore by yourself. I will give you all the links to that. Uh, let's go on and let's talk about another project. Also, you will have the links to this. Uh, this is Brian Fu, also known as Data Driven DJ. He is uh, quite famous in the field of data visualization, but also data sonification. He is focusing on uh, uh, making public resources um, more visible and accessible to the general public, uh, creating visualization, sonification, and uh, application. Um, he, is, he is also very appreciated because his uh, process is very uh, open because he always released all the tools he used to create those uh, piece of arts and uh, also the data set and he, share, uh, he shares with the community how he was able to create all those examples. I would like to go on uh, and then maybe we can take a break. The last example I would like to illustrate is this one from System Sound, which is a sonification of the moon impact, where sound is related to the pitch of sound is related to the amplitude of the crater and also the volume. It's a good way to find anomalies because you will hear around 219 million years ago you will hear a lot of impacts This is also quite interesting to me because the sound, the drone sound that we are hearing uh, below as a, a background music is also created by sonifying the uh, land surface and turning it directly into a sound wave. I think if you, if that we can maybe have a little break before going on. Uh, we can say uh, see you in maybe five minutes five minutes so thank you to all see you later
Okay. So, do you guys have any questions about what we have just seen? Okay. There are quite uh, there are a lot of examples of all the things that I've shown you. Uh, there's also a very good book about that that is called the Sunification Handbook. I will leave you all the references in the last uh, slides and uh, simply by taking a look at Google, looking for data sunification, you will find very interesting stuff. We are gonna see, we have seen only a few of them, but there are very, more and more of them very interesting. I would like now to start again, talking about another, uh, to me, another uh, artistic expression of data sonification, if you'd like, which is a project by Dot Dot, because some months ago, the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology uh, of Lisbon, Portugal, asked Dodo Dot to create uh, an interactive, um, uh, an experience, a user experience based on data in order to raise collective awareness around the global climate crisis. And so Dodo Dot created the third bits sensing the planetary, which is the name of the, the exhibit, which contains uh, video walls and also um, other elements related to user interaction, database, and so on, all based on data collected um, with the support and scientific support by the European Space Agency and also the International Energy Agency and also the Portuguese electric company, the ADP. And I think one of the most interesting elements of this exhibit is this console that uh, we created here at dot the dot, the open dot, uh, which is uh, an interactive physical, uh, as you see from those I these images, uh, console, uh, also with a graphical user interface where users uh, can uh, move, uh, rotate, move, touch those controllers like if it was a kind of a mixer in order to insert the information about their habits in uh, mobility, housing, nutrition and so on, and so on in order to create uh, a sort of, uh, we can call it like an index to evaluate the user impact on the global uh, CO2, uh, uh, CO2 emissions and uh, this console uh, by inputting data through those controls you are not only changing what you, have, what you are seeing in front of you by means of this graphical user interface, but you're also changing the soundscape and what you hear, because here we have uh, played a lot with those concepts we have seen before of uh, uh, mapping functions, because all of those uh, all of the controls are directly mapped to a sound parameter, which is the volume of a particular musical instrument and also uh, we have uh, one too many mapping I would like if I'm capable of of showing it to you directly from Super Collider we're gonna see it later but now we are making some experiment with the a sort of simulation of what users can actually do in math at Lisbon. Let me, I would like to maybe raise some of these controllers in order 
and asking if you are capable of hearing something. Okay, so this is a simulation as I told you. All those controllers uh, lets the user insert uh, uh, their habits in traveling by car, let's say motorbike, train, all those values uh, obviously uh, impact in different way on the CO2 production. So let's say that if I travel by plane, I will produce more CO2 than traveling by train and so on. If I eat more uh, beef meat, uh, I will be uh, a bird person instead of other person using uh, and uh, eating uh, more fruit and so on. I can also select uh, the number of TVs I have in my house or maybe the number of PCs and so on. If I have a dishwasher, a dryer, a refrigerator, if I'm using air conditioned and so on. As you see, like in this simulation, every control is directly connected to the volume of a single musical instrument. So these are all, we can say, these are all direct mapping. The control moving from 0 to 255 are directly mapped to the intensity, the energy of the sound. Sometimes uh, this mapping is different because we have also rhythmical elements like, let's say, this TV. The number one in this case is like a number that is telling how those rhythmical accents are distributed in time. If I move this to two, I have something different. So I can create a first mix. It's worth saying that we not only have direct mapping, in this case mapping data from the user uh, interaction to the sound uh, synthesis uh, machine, but we also have an overall calculation of all this user contribution in order to create that index I was talking about uh, before, what I have called the seriousness index which is an index uh, which is telling how uh, my uh, decision and habits are good or bad. I have here a schematics, a diagram to, I want to show you. So if my CO2 production is uh, uh, good, also the music has a lower BPM, the time envelope uh, are more relaxed, also the timber of the musical instrument are quite smooth, the harmony is consonant, but while we are moving from good to bad, you will hear this soundscape to translate from an emotion, a good emotion, let's say, to a more frenetic and dissonant uh, environment, sound environment. Let's try it because, of course, we don't have here all the pieces of software we have, we have actually used at the mat, but because of this is a simulation, we can try it uh, ourselves. Let's say that I want to move the seriousness uh, and make it, it increase quite uh, quite slower, quite slow, from zero to one hundred. You will hear. The rhythm is slightly, slightly changing, becoming more and more fast. And then at, certain, at a certain point, you will hear also the harmony changing. 
Now musical notes can be also dissonant from one another. Let's keep increase. I'm doing it very bad. Let's go on. And now I've reached the worst scenarios, worst case scenario. As you can see from these examples, we can use sound and uh, uh, to transfer uh, meaning to uh, users because we have uh, kind of uh, found some relation between a good situation or a bad situation to a particular music musical uh, meaning. Another uh, thing that I would like to spend some time on is the fact that we have also used harmony because we can, uh, let me turn off all of this in order for you to better listen to what I want you to, to pay attention to. Like this slide is showing you, I've I took inspiration from a work by Loring Spiegel, which back in 1986 wrote a software for the Apple uh, computer, which uh, were, was called Music Mouse. And uh, this Music Mouse software let the user uh, move the mouse around in this 2D dimensional space in order to create interesting musical accompaniment and the musical notes were all snapped to particular musical scales like we have here actually in this emotion controller so if i use if i i want to play it with the piano you can see that now we are playing notes from the first available scale which is a pentatonic scale which i have selected for the uh, good situation and then moving this controller around I always have notes that are inside something that I can call uh, I can say to be uh, good to listen to I always have something that is consonant which is interesting and also beautiful in a certain way but when I move the seriousness controller up the scales also moves when i am below 25 percent you see this controller has changed and now not all the musical notes that i'm selecting are kind of playing well together this is a major scale and then we can increase again the seriousness controller and move up to the 50 percent in order to select also just another scale which is a chromatic scale where these dissonance are emphasized those dissonances are more emphasized even more when we move be, uh, above the 75 percent where we are using the so-called octatonic or rhythmic classical scale here the dissonance is very 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 high and also you are capable also to to hear the fact that this piano is not a piano anymore is quite distorted and also uh, has a very fast vibrato on him so that's what i have told you before this is a mapping function that 
is directly connected to many of the sound parameters. So we have a single control that is this serious net control that we are using to change many aspects of the sound synthesis. And uh, this is quite an example that I uh, found, I, I, uh, I think could be interesting to show to you. So now that we have uh, completed the data sonification uh, topic, I would like to introduce you to the Super Collider tool. I don't know uh, if, uh, if you have already uh, downloaded it or uh, installed. We are going to go through uh, some step, maybe. Uh, first of all, what is Super Collider? We are going to use it because I think that is a very interesting tool. We use it a lot here in the, in uh, dot dot open dot, and it was uh, created by uh, James McCarthy back in 1996 as a plugin for Max MSP on the Apple uh, Mac environment. It was originally released as a w um, way to create, uh, to make real-time audio synthesis and also um, uh, as a way to, cre um, to create algorithmic composition. This is the definition taken directly from Wikipedia. This is the guy, James McCarthy, and this is an image that I found uh, of the first version of Super Collider and its user manual. Now that more than 25 years have passed, uh, Super Collider uh, become a free software and also a multi-platform software. Uh, it has uh, grown a lot and also it is maintained by a very large community of users, researchers and developers. Uh, I also would like to share with you some slides taken directly from the Super Collider user survey uh, that the Super Collider community uh, created in 2019. So you are able from this slide to see how many people are, are using Super Collider in all of these different platforms. There's a lot of people using macOS, but also it is used also in other different uh, platforms. Uh, it is also a tool which is uh, also very known and also has a very good reputation in the academic world. This is a quote from Andrea Valle, which is a researcher and a musician from the University of Turin. Uh, he also uh, wrote a very interesting book about Super Collider. Its title is Introduction to Super Collider. Uh, it can be a very good resource. Uh, to start learning the first uh, concept of this tool. People think that Super Collider is quite powerful, as you see, it's also fun, but it's qu also quite difficult, <laughs> and also maybe can be unstable, but we are going to see, you will, you will tell me. Super Collider is used in many fields, the one we are interested in today is the data sonification. Here you also can see an image from the cover of the book um, about data sonification, the data sonification handbook, which is very interesting. But also Super Collider can be used in many other fields, of course. We, yes, have data sonification, but we can use it in places like uh, electroacoustic compositions. Here we have two examples. Uh, where those two artists uh, used, use uh, Super Collider a lot. For example, the first example is from a musician and, compo and composer which uses Super Collider to send back to his digital piano, which is a disc clavier capable of uh, uh, getting input from outside in form of MIDI notes from Yamaha. He uses Super Collider to create real-time piano accompaniment to his musical phrases, and he also use it live in uh, his concerts. On the other side, we have Ellie Fields, 
uh, in a musical performance where he wears uh, gloves full of sensors, maybe gyroscopes, accelerometers, and so on, in order to send MIDI data inputs to Super Collider to manage the positioning of sound in space over a multi-channel setup and also to change musical parameter in real time. Also, uh, worth mentioning it, uh, Ellie Fieldstills is a great teacher and has a great uh, YouTube channel uh, full of interesting resources to start moving the first steps in the world of Super Collider and um, music synthesis, music uh, uh, composition, uh, generative music composition and sound synthesis with this tool. Other two examples taken from our direct experience because those are two works from dot to dot because uh, we have also used Super Collider as I told you a lot here uh, in context of interactive audio in all those places where we need the soundscape to change according to the user inputs. Uh, then worth mentioning is that Super Collider is a very powerful machine that can uh, deal with a lot of uh, dimensions in terms of a number of musical channels to be produced in real time. Uh, this is another work by Dot 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 in a place where we had a 360 room with eight speaker, um, all uh, the sound sources uh, uh, need to be moved around according to what is happening on the 360 screens and so Super Collider will, uh, can also be used as a, a very, very powerful tool to do all this positioning stuff in the uh, 3D uh, and not only 2D but also 3D uh, audio space. But also live coding is another place where you can find Super Collider, all those contexts where you need a powerful tool to create sound live. Uh, also Super Collider different from other kind of software where you need to write your code, where you need then to compile it and then to deploy the final application. You can use Super Collider in real time to create the music that people is dancing to. These, these are all examples of people making music with Super Collider or at least uh, through the uh, using the synthesizer engine of Super Collider because we are, we are going to see it. Super Collider is an environment made of different parts. But also we have as exoteric if you want a uh, way of expressing things with Super Collider. I'm not referring directly to the left side of this slide because yes, with Super Collider you can also build GUI elements and also visualization the same way processing can do it. I don't know how many of you have used maybe processing before. is uh, quite an interesting tool to create uh, animation and, and graphics. Also Super Collider is capable of doing that. Uh, this is a great book to learn to do that but also as you see here on the right side we have this strange SC140 movement which is a kind of uh, uh, a kind of fight between Super Collider user uh, they are trying to compress the code uh, in less space as they can uh, maybe in 140 characters and this should be called capable of doing interesting results like this one from Frederick Olofsson you're actually hearing music from the code that is written in those lines Quite cool to me.
that you are capable of doing these interest of, of obtaining those interesting effects only by writing so uh, a small uh, unreadable of course because it's very difficult to understand what is going on here but uh, you can do that in very uh, in a small amount of, of, of space. Also, you uh, can see below that Frederick Olofsson is also interested in the graphical parts because also this is code that is dynamically created in uh, in Super Collider. Uh, let's, let me see. Oh yes, this is another slide from the survey where people were telling uh, to the community what are the fields they are using Super Collider. Many of them are using Super Collider for music and composition, but a lot of them they use Super Collider only for synthesis, to creating DST effects for other musical though, let's say, to create plugin and also data sonification and so on. Let's go deep in the definition of Super Collider. We have seen that it is thought to be an environment, yes, because it is made of many components, but it's also uh, Super Collider is a word that we can use to define a specific programming language. And uh, we, we can use it for real time audio synthesis and also algorithmic composition, which are kind of two separate ways of seeing the things because if we are interested in the uh, working with raw audio data, Super Collider is capable of uh, uh, giving us all the tool we need to go deep and uh, kind of uh, work with the smallest unit of time uh, with audio. But also you can work in Super Collider from a more uh, abstract point of view, which makes Compose, composers uh, happy to because you can use Super Collider uh, talking to him in terms of musical notes, scales, chords, uh, degree of the scales, octaves, uh, transposition, and so on. Super Collider is a language we have already seen it. Uh, before we, uh, we told about uh, processing which is also a programming language and uh, in order to write code we need a text editor and in most cases we uh, also use the EDE which is uh, which is coming with the software installation for example processing as its own IDE like Arduino and so on Super Collider also has its own IDE uh, its own integrated development development environment which is called SGID but also we need a way for this code to be executed say let's say uh, a way for this code to be interpreted and that's why super colliders is also made of another tool which is called SGLang which is the super collider language interpreter which is also a client of an architecture made of two elements, a client, of course, and also a server, the SG scenes. They talk to each other by means of exchanging OSC messages. This protocol, which is similar to MIDI uh, protocol, is uh, called Open Sound Control. So if we are talking about Super Collider or maybe Super Collider application, we are actually talking about all those elements. And all those elements are installed on your computer uh, when you download it from the website and, uh, and use it. We have told uh, that Super Collider uh, language is a client, but also you see here that, that there are many clients of the same server. You can use Tidal Cycle, also Sonic Pi. There are a uh, way of uh, interpreting your code, but uh, under the hood, they are always talking with SC Synth, which is the main component of Super Collider. So now I would like, if you want, to move the first steps uh, with the software 
any question about what we have seen? So, let's close all of those and let's start from the beginning. Maybe with interpreter and also I can see uh, it's of course okay so if this is your first time with super collider I think that this is the way super collider will uh, present it to you probably you will see it in a white fashion like this one but I prefer to use the Dracula color scheme okay so first of all this is the part of the software which we mentioned before which is the IDE uh, inside it there are a lot of tools very useful to write code evaluate it and also uh, to get documentation for, for the code we will be writing and so on the, this first part on the left side of the screen is the uh, place where we are gonna write some blah 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 code and then on the right side we have two different places we can also take them and move them around if we prefer to place them in other places of our screen but the most important one is the oh let me see I don't want them to be one on the above the other I want it to stay on the bottom okay so the most more the most important one is the one that we have here below on the lower right corner which is the post window is the place where the interpreter is gonna tell you hey you are doing this right hey you are doing this wrong where the interpreter we are gonna post uh, is gonna posting errors and stuff like that on the upper part we have the a documentation browser this is actually a browser because you can click on those elements and use them as they were links because we can move all around maybe we are interested in uh, looking for something related to guy so we can click and go through all these voices maybe we want let's say a toolbar let's say and then we are directly uh, redirected to the specific part of the documentation tool talking about these elements uh, the documentation is also uh, not all the classes are well, so well documented but the most important one are so I suggest you to use this documentation a lot if it's gonna help you very much so let's start writing something this is uh, an interpreter we have told it so we can write expression like this one and now we are going to learn our first super collider shortcut in super collider uh, we have to evaluate code by using specific uh, keyboard combination the we have first to place our cursor on the line that we want to evaluate the first line in our case and then press the combination of shift and return if it is working to you i think you're gonna see the number five in the post window another interesting shortcut I'm gonna use it right now is to clear the post window to make some space for us some housekeeping with control shift P
are you able to evaluate this line and get some information on the post window? Okay, cool. So another interesting thing is uh, how Super Collider manage uh, comments because sometimes the most of time, most of times we want to uh, take notes about what we are writing so we can write comment like this or maybe we can do comments I think JavaScript is using comments like multi lines comment using slash and asterisks this way okay in super collider there are uh, uh, a particular way of evaluating methods is used like in other languages which is called the dot syntax so if we uh, write something like this three dot post ln we are gonna call the method post ln on the number three if we evaluate this line we simply gonna see the number three on the post window which is quite clear but we also can use different methods if we are gonna uh, ask ourselves if three is an odd number we can call the odd method on the number three and the answer will be true stuff like that even of course is false because three is part is an instance of a class which is called integer we can also call the method class on the number three to inspect it i think that we're gonna see on the post window that three yes is an integer try to write on the document we are writing the word integer with a capital letter e at the beginning another interesting features of an ide is that he is using the syntax highlight in order for, for us to better understand what we are writing. Integer is the name of the class to uh, which uh, tree belongs to. If we click on the word integer or place the cursor inside it, we can also use another very interesting shortcut to me, which is Control D, which gonna bring us directly to the documentation page of the class itself if we go through this class we are gonna see that we have a lot of method that we can use on some integer instance we can do a for for example we can also do let's say convert it as a binary number or maybe an ashi code we can also ask if it is odd and even we have already used it this power of two and then and so on this is quite a thing that we you will find yourself doing a lot to use the control d at least the first uh, time you, you use the, the language uh, ba -ba -ba. then we can also write something that is not a number we can write stuff like that enclosed between double uh, double quotes and then we are gonna post it let me examine this is a string of course so uh, a note worth mentioning it is that even if uh, uh, maybe some of us is used to play with 
uh, different uh, languages. And then when we get an error from those languages, we simply have a complaint uh, from the compiler or the interpreter in our uh, console uh, as a log. But when we are dealing with sound, especially in this case with Super Collider, errors can also be in uh, sounding format, let's say. And then if we make something wrong, it can be also harmful for our ears. So what I'm uh, telling to you is that uh, now that we are going, going to play with sound with Super Collider, let's keep the volume of your headphone low in order not to damage your ear because if you make some mistakes you will not see it only in the post window you also will hear it quite uh, quite loud um, there is also a way to lower just the volume of super collider instead of lowering the volume of uh... yes of course uh, is there a way to do that because if you examine super collider on the lower right corner you uh, will see uh, a list of white numbers uh, the first one is not white is green actually because we have our interpreter active at the moment but also there are numbers related to the server if you click on those numbers you will see a pop-up window and then you can uh, I think that you cannot move like me. I'm. I cannot move it right now because the server is not turned on uh, for the moment. But we can use this slider later when we are going to play with the with the server. We are gonna use the server only when we need to produce sound because it's the server, the uh, the element that is talking to the sound card of our PC or maybe our uh, external sound card. So I think that we can try to uh, play our first sound before making a break and then we are gonna continue uh, in the next part. So in order to play our first sound we have to deal with what is called functions and eugens which are elements taken from another uh, historical musical language which is called music n uh, the first eugen we are gonna uh, play with is the sine osc sine osc if we go to the documentation for it is a sine wave oscillator it will produce a sound in a form of a sinusoidal wave as you see in these uh, part of the documentation sine osc takes two different methods the first one is ar and the second one is kr those are elements and methods used to respectively let the server produce an audio rate uh, signal or a control rate signal it is a way to telling the synth to the sc synth to make much more calculation when we want this OSC, uh, synth OSC to be audio or maybe use it as a controller so we are not interested to be uh, quite uh, uh, fast so we can use the control rate for the, our purposes we can use the AR method and then we can open uh, the parentheses as you see the IDE is suggesting to you what are the parameters that the sinus G is asking to us? The first uh, element is the vibration frequency. We saw them before. Uh, we are going to try with the default parameter, so 440. And then we, we, can, all, we can discard the information uh, after that. Maybe we can also multiply the sinus G. Uh, by a number which is less than one in order to keep the volume of the, sa the sound uh, quiet and then we are gonna enclose all of these uh, mathematical expression inside curly braces in order to create a function then we are gonna evaluate 
the method play on it. Don't do anything for the moment because if you do it, you are not going to hear anything. Because, first of all, because we want the server to produce audio for us, we also have to boot the server. We can do it in different way. From the menu here, we can simply click on boot server. We can also use the control D uh, shortcut. Let's try with it. Now my server is up and running and now the white numbers below are now uh, turned into green. I think Tiziano that now we can move the slider in order to turn down the volume. So let's keep it down and then after cleaning up the post window we can try to make a sound. Now one important information I forgot to tell you is that in order to kill the sound you should use another shortcut which is control period. Are you able to hear something? Oh, yes, cool. I think that uh, also you are hearing a sinusoidal wave on the left channel of your headphones. Okay, cool. Any question? Okay, guys, if you are with me, I think that we can make a pause now and uh, uh, turn back here in, say, 10 minutes. Okay, cool. See you later. Bye.
Okay. Here we are. Did you try something new? Have you tried some some other experiment? I've seen in the chat that some one of you have uh, had some problem with the sampling rate. Those are the kind of stuff that happens when you first start your super collider session because you have to first of all understand how super collider is talking with the driver of your uh, sound card but then and always is different from platform to platform I, I'm using Linux now and I have to use also Jack to connect and uh, route all the audio from super collider uh, in my machine I think and uh, I know that is quite different from Mac OS and Windows but uh, another valuable uh, platform where you can where you can find help is also the super collider community and you can reach it simply by going on sgsynth.org which is a great place full of helpful people you can always post here new topics if you have any kind of problem you can also search and there's a lot of people asking for any kind of questions from the mobile questions to the more difficult one uh, also here you can find interesting information about venues and also concerts and also uh, maybe uh, surveys that the community is making you can uh, keep in contact with uh, the actual super collider developers and also sometimes are actually them to answer to you to your questions quite interesting uh, way of uh, being in a community Okay, if you want, we can move on and make some other sound. We were here trying to play in our first sinusoidal wave, and I think maybe if I evaluate this line of code, also you should hear this. Okay, let's see if this slider is working. Now the volume is increasing and then it's going down. You are listening to this sound wave only on the left speaker or the left headphone. And here we are talking about other interesting uh, elements of uh, Super Collider that we can use for debugging. Yes, if we use simply uh, a, a textual uh, programming language, we uh, are okay only uh, simply with the things that are posted in the console window complaining but for errors and so on but from the moment that we are dealing with audio we can introduce some other useful debugging tools especially meant to deal with the audio let's start by uh, examining for example the meter we can use the meter method on the letter S. When we evaluate this line of code, we see this little window appearing where we are capable of uh, seeing the level of our input audio but also the level of the output. Let's evaluate the sign. As you see, we have here a color indicating that the sinusoidal wave is here on the server side and it has been outputted on the first output channel numbered with zero. When we kill the sound as the, the synth, by pressing control period 
now we don't have this colored line anymore we can also use other uh, element for debugging sound for example another one always called on the letter s is the scope the scope tool is uh, another guy element that that is uh, showing to you the waveform of the audio going uh, uh, being added by super collider let's see evaluate evaluate the line with the sine osc we can also increase the dimension horizontally and vertically in order to amplify at least visually the effect of the sinusoidal wave and now we are pretty we are good with it in fact we are seeing actually a sinusoidal wave moving this is what we are actually creating from the server side perfectly fine we can also use another uh, debug element always evaluable evaluable on the letter s which is the not the scope but the frex scope the frex scope is another uh, interesting tool that is uh, examining the audio from the frequency spectrum point of view let's start the frex scope let's keep it on top and then i will bring the, the server volume up i can see that we have a spike in this frequency analyzer tool which is in correspondence of the frequency we have selected 440 and we can have uh, an example of this also by maybe by changing the frequency on this uh, synthesizer we are creating here let's stop the sound and maybe let's change the frequency to double it 880 which is an octave above don't know if you are able to follow me in writing code and also to see all those debug elements i think you can see clearly that this spike is moving up and so we can write it in a different way maybe we can try to uh, use a multiplication by three and also we can duplicate the complete line in order to create a lot of those for one, two, let's try it all, those different sinusoids. We can evaluate many lines of code only once by enclosing all those lines inside curved parentheses. If we evaluate all of them one by one, We are creating harmonic progression just to show it to you we can evaluate this block of code all in once by using another shortcut which is a shortcut to evaluate a group of line the uh, important things is that all those lines must be enclosed between two curved parentheses i will use a different shortcut instead of the shift return that we have already used I'm going to use control return to evaluate all of this at once. Is it working for you? Okay, cool. So, the strange thing to me, even the first time that I saw Super Collider, is that we have to use this little letter S if we clear the post window and maybe try to evaluate the single line with a little letter 
letter S on it, we see that the post windows is telling us that this is the local host. What does it mean? Simply, we can say that the interpreter, uh, when we uh, start for the first time Super Collider, is reserving all the lowercase letters for us uh, as a, a method for us to uh, save on them variables and values. And by default, Super Collider is saving on the letter S as a variable a reference to the local server. So every time we use the letter S and evaluate methods on it, we uh, are actually doing operation on the server running on our machine. If we want, if we want to have more information on what we can do with the letter S, we can simply uh, can uh, we can simply use the word server with the capital letter S because we are looking for the class server and its documentation and press the Control D in order to go directly to the documentation itself. If you go down, you can see maybe something. I was looking for a way to kill the server. Yes, you see server.killall query the system for any SC server apps and art quit them. So if I use S kill all and then I evaluate this line, I will instantaneously see all those green numbers turn oi turn white but we have an error so we are experiencing for our first time this maybe because this is a class method and not an instance method let me see if i can do it in a different way maybe also i can use this on the class Oh yes, because this is a class method. Sorry for bothering you with this. This is a method that I can use on the class and I cannot use it simply on an instance of it. Probably the method kill is working. Like we can kill a server, we can also boot the server calling the boot method on the letter S. Let me see if the method kill is working. No. Quit. Yes, of course. Okay, here we are. So we can use boot to turn the server up and we can use quit to kill it. If we don't want to bother with this voice on this menu, because we can always do those operation by using the GUI of the SC IDE. Okay. Another cool stuff to me that I want to show is another debugging tool which can be quite useful when you are dealing with a lot, a lot of sounds and it's also useful to debug problems when you have glitches in your audio and so on. It's a tool that is called uh, 3, Node 3. We can show it by simply using the method plot3 with this camo case. If I evaluate this, now that I, I have not my server, okay, I press to boot it up like this, and then I have to evaluate this method. Oh, here we are. This is a sort of graph that is representing uh, the internal structure of the server. You can see that on top of this uh, node tree view, we have a group that is called the default group. Let's try to evaluate the first scene. You can see that on the server side, something new appeared inside the default group. This is actually the representation of the synthesizer that is playing on the server side. It has been assigned the name of temp14 in my case. If I evaluate other scenes, 
uh, now I have an increasing number for all those synth instances. Let me turn down the volume in order for you to do it on your side because I think that you are hearing my sound, my super collider sound, in addition to yours. And then you can see we have one, two, three, four new scenes inside the default group. And now I think that I have something. Okay, so this number corresponds to the green number that we have on the bottom here. Now I have five scenes running on the server because I have four of them in the default group and this other one, which is the amplitude control. I think this is related to the fact that I'm using this slider, which is in fact outside the default group. So another way to understand this little green number on the bottom is to kill all the instrument with the famous shortcut control period. You will see instantly all the elements going out from the default group. It still remain the first synth, which is this volume amplitude control. Then, uh, now, what about if I want to uh, modify the synth and when I have created it? Now we have just created synth and uh, um, kill them all together, but maybe I'm interested in uh, creating a lot of scenes and maybe modifying parameters for simply one of them or maybe kill the most annoying ones and so I need to keep a reference uh, to the scenes that I'm just creating. Uh, I think that we can do this uh, using the small letters like say I want to use the letter A to do that. I don't know if it's gonna work. I can simply evaluating this line, and then I have my sync on the server side. I can use the method free on the letter A in order to kill the sync which was previously saved inside the letter A. So we can use A to keep a reference. It's not, not, not a matter of the letter you are choosing. The important stuff is that you are not going to use the letter S because you are going to overwrite the reference to the server. So we can use a lot of those letters in order to create instances of our synth and later maybe modify or free the memory from calculation uh, for those synths. If you are interested in doing operation with specific uh, things, but let's do something more interesting than this, because uh, this is quite uh, an annoying way of playing with uh, musical parameters and uh, and scene definition itself. We are gonna see it in a different way. We are gonna introduce an important class. We are gonna use it a lot which is called SYNDEF. A SYNDEF is a way of, for us to provide information to the server on the way the server can cook. It's a sort of recipe, if you want. It's a sort of a way that we can tell the server how to cook a particular uh, sound for us. And uh, the SYNDEF methods is asking us for a series of things. Let's take a look at the documentation. The documentation is telling us that we can create it a new one, providing it a name and also an Eugen graph function. Let's start by this. So we can use the method new on a syndef, or if you prefer, as a shortcut, we can simply open the parentheses just right at the end of the syndef word. Now we can give a name. We, we can tell our synth to be named test. We have to use the backslash in order to 
format this text as a symbol. And then in bold you see a suggestion from the ID. We have to provide the Eugen graph function. This is nothing different from the thing that we have already done here when we have used the curly braces. Everything that is inside those curly braces brackets are uh, functions. So we can provide exactly the same things in the same definition. Maybe I want to put it in a better looking way. And also I want to enclose this in parentheses. I forgot to close a full parenthesis here. And also I have to add this definition to the list of synth description uh, on the server side. I also have to provide a way for the server to know where to uh, output the sound to. In order to do that, I'm gonna use the out.ar Eugen, which is asking us where do you want the audio to go through. I want the audio to go through the first output, which is index 0, and I also want the channels array to be our actual signal, which is our sinusoidal region. I can put it here like this. And then I can close the parentheses, a semicolon, and I think that I'm done. Let's try evaluate this block of code. Note that I placed a first curved bracket at the beginning and a closed one at the end. I can evaluate this block of code and the post windows tell me, yes, you have uh, successfully created your first sim definition, which is called test. Now I can create an instance of a sim, which is created following the same exact recipe. Let's do it keeping a reference to it. You mean the code. Let me see. Maybe as Tiziano is telling me, I can provide you this little snippet here in chat. You can simply copy and paste it into your uh, IDE. And then, in order to use a recipe, we have to refer to another class, which is called synth, which is a way to tell the server, hey, create for me a synth and place it a reference to it on the letter A, and I want you to use the recipe you already know which is called test. If I evaluate this line, you can see that now we are actually say, doing the same thing as before, only in a different way. We will see later how it is important. We can always use the method free in order to kill this particular instance. Okay, cool. Any question? Everything is clear. Okay. We have seen the concept of synth description definition and also a way to use those definition in order to actually create instances of those uh, synthesizers on the server side. So let's try to complicate a bit, a bit this uh, function. We can make it more clear to see creating, because we are telling about a function inside this in definition, we can use variables using the, this particular keyword that is called var. To me, it's quite, uh, I'm used to call sig, everything that is an audio signal and then I'm interested to uh, change my scene definition this way 
which is actually the same exact way to do this that stuff. Evaluating this line of code simply overwrite uh, the actual definition that is on the server side. It's still working like before. Then I'm quite tired of hearing the sound only on the left speaker, so I want to pan it in the center. So let's change this second part of the out.ar to another uh, using another eugen, which is called pan2. Pan2 is a eugen which is working, and now we are working with it always in audio rate terms. And pan is a particular eugen that wants an input signal and a position description. A position is a floating number that is going from minus one to plus one, uh, respectively uh, defining the leftmost side of our stereo image and the rightmost part. So I want the signal to depend on the center if I use zero. Now let's change this definition by evaluating this again and then uh, I think that we're gonna hear it in the middle of our head. We can also inspect it by using the what we now we already know, which is the meter. As you see from here, our sound is coming out from both the speakers. Okay, cool. Are you capable of following me? Okay, so now let's examine another interesting uh, stuff, which is a way of uh, telling the server to change some internal uh, mechanism of the synth, uh, providing parameters from the outside. So when we create a synth and it's uh, it is living on the server side, we can always exchange messages to the synth which is running on the server, changing its parameter. We have to use a different keyword which is called arg. I want this arg to be, I'm interested in changing the frequency of the sinusoidal wave, so I can provide a default parameter which is 440 and I have to keep in mind that I also have to change the way uh, we pass the frequency to the sinus G. In our case, this is a parameterized uh, value. We can change it. And now, if we evaluate this sync, we are going to see and, and listen to the same exact thing like before, but we can use different methods like the set method in order to change some argument on the synth side. We have always to use a backslash to address a specific argument. In our case, this is frequency, and we can change the frequency by using different values, let's say the octave above. Or maybe the octave below and so on this is very annoying we can also provide directly in the moment of the creation of the sync those argument directly in the sync instantiation by using square brackets using the same syntax as before, freak, and then we can instantiate many of them, maybe with different parameters. Yes, of course I've made an error because I have overwritten the letter A, but you can do this.
and then you can kill all together uh, either with your shortcut or by referencing to each letter at once okay cool now we have seen how to modify internal parameters of the synth we can also uh, add some more arguments maybe we can also be interested in modifying the amplitude of the synth we can also be interested in modifying its pen by providing these in a parameterized way and also I want to tell you another shortcut uh, syntax sugar isn't it the way that we can use different way to write things to have the same effect instead of using the arg keywords we can use the pipe at the beginning and at the end this is the same exact way of providing parameters to our synthetize So we can evaluate the frequency and then we can change the amplitude with the set method. Keep in mind that it's better for you to use numbers that are below one here in order not to break your ear. It's completely fine also if you want to use number that are greater than one but you have always to keep your volume under control you can also set many parameters all at once always with the method set and also you can change the pen if you want let's see the meter here Let's use minus one to move it all the way to the left, to move it all the way to the right, and all the various points in between. Is everything clear till now? Okay, so I want to move on. Before we have uh, we have seen the uh, the fact that the sound can have a duration in time, now we are only capable of uh, creating scenes that are gonna play forever and ever. I want to create scenes that are capable to uh, play uh, for a short portion of time. Let's do that by creating a new scene definition, which I can call another way maybe amp test and now I'm gonna use another variable inside inside my scene definition which I like to call amp let's take a break for a moment before actually doing it inside the scene definition let's examine a particular class that we are going to use in our code which is called env env is a way that super collider give us to create particular uh, evolving amplitude shapes i can call different methods on env one of these is called perk because it's helping us in creating percussive envelopes when you want to create a percussive envelope, you have to provide two values. The first one is the attack time, and the second one is the release time. We are perfectly fine for now with the default values. So we can simply close the parentheses, and then we can use a useful method. This is the first time we see it, which is the plot method. The plot method evaluated on the percussion on the on the envelope instance simply put in front a window which is a graph of the amplitude over time as you see we have a quick uh, curve going from zero to one the maximum amplitude and then 
going down with a slope till we reach 1.01 second I think because the default argument for the attack is was, was 0 0.01 we can provide our own values what about if I want an attack time of 4 seconds and a release time of 4 seconds or 2 if I plot this I can see this strange shape but this is because we can also provide values for curvature of our curve For example, uh, I can examine those values that the percussive uh, envelope is asking for us. You can see we is asking for us the curve parameters. We can simply I don't we don't want to uh, tell the envelope about this level. We want to use the default value for this. We want to provide something for the curve parameter so we simply have to explicitly tell that we want to talk in terms of curve and because we have two lines we have to provide not a single number but a list of numbers telling that we want four for the first segment and maybe we want two for the second segment those are all elements that are uh, explained very well in the documentation and those indexes represent the way and the amount of curvature of every single line i think that we can also use a single number and it will be used for both the envelope segment zero is a linear envelope so now we are seeing a triangle isn't it I have a lot of those windows open it I can close them another way of seeing if we are gonna if you are doing the things in a correct way is also to test the envelope and the scene this the SG scene we are gonna create a temporary scene for us only for us to listen to our envelope so let's hear what the default percussive envelope sound like with a method test are you capable of hearing something uh, actually i can't hear the sound from super from super collider anymore um, i don't know I mean, if it's me or... i think that if you're listening to my instance of super collider that's because i have not connected the output of my super collider to the input of ah, okay, 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 okay. let me try uh, it again I, i've missed it okay okay what sorry. about simone now yes, yes okay sorry. sorry i think that this kind of connection which is i i creating i'm creating my side on this linux machine by the means of using this software that is called package is uh, will be broken every time I restart the, se the server from the beginning so I have to make the, co the connection every time so not a problem if you are uh, actually listening to your own uh, uh, server sound so now that we have seen the way uh, to create a percussive envelope yes of course we have a lot of different kind of envelope if we take a look at the documentation for the envelope class, we can see that we can not only create a custom made envelope, we can simply rely on the uh, shape that we have here. Line N is triangle shape, sign, percussive. We have just used it. We have also a typical envelope that are used uh, for sustained sound. So I think that we are going to find the ADSR, which, which stands for Attack, Decay, Sustain and Release. We have DA, DSR, which I don't know what it is. Okay, because we have, are adding also a delay time at the, at the, the starting point. We have many of them, very a lot. Cycle, I don't know what it is. But we can always take a look of the documentation in order to better understand what is going on so in order to use this envelope 
we have to put it inside the scene definition but in order to do that we have to use another enclosing class because yes env is creating the description for the envelope but we have to provide also a way for this description to become real audio signal and so we need to use an instance of the mgen which is another eugen which wants an instance of the m description so we can simply use the percussive description from before and then i think that we can for the moment uh, pay no attention to all the other elements now that we have created an envelope we can simply adding a multiplication at the end of the sig line and also for the matter of clearness i want to do something like this sig per end so let's say that i'm more happy with this syntax is it clear to you here we are creating a variable that is that is the envelope of the signal here we are actually creating the signal that will be, be will be multiplied by a general amplitude which can we can provide from the outside world and also the amplitude is going to uh, be modified in real time uh, evolving according to this envelope percussive envelope we have created then this uh, compound signal let's say will be sent throughout via this pan like before so sorry guys I, I'm trying also to paste this definition to the chat if you wanted to use it I'm gonna clear the post window and then I'm going to evaluate this scene definition I don't have to forget to place those proved parentheses okay now we have our new scene which is called mtest i can try to evaluate it i like now to use the letter x i have always to use the class synth and now i have to recall the mtest description i'm happy with the default parameter so let's try to evaluate this I think then also you will gonna listen to something different from before. Now the sound is starting, going, reaching its maximum amplitude, and then the amplitude is going back to zero. I can try also to provide as before custom parameters to that. okay now take a look at the little green number on the bottom of your screen you see that you have 12 synthesizer running on your uh, at least me i have 12 synthesizer on my side so let's examine the famous three node three you can see on the default group I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine instances running on the server side while I'm hearing nothing. This is because even if the sound amplitude has reached its zero value, the calculation inside the synth graph is still going on. And you can also see it from the percentage of the CPU usage on these, uh, the first two numbers here. That's why we have to take care in doing instantiation. We have to take care of, of freeing the synth that are not useful anymore. Uh, we, have, we can do this simply by adding some uh, action to the synth description first of all let's free all of them and then let's return back to the synth description and then let's take a look to the, def the default parameters that mgen 
wants us to give him envelope we have already told him what kind of envelope we want gate it's not a problem for us level scale is a way of scaling up and down those curves those lines of the envelope level bias time scale okay here we are done action done action is an argument that is telling the synth what to do when the sound when the envelope is finished so done action takes many values it can be zero which means do nothing simply leave the scene that is not producing sound anymore in the exact same place on the server side but we can use another number which is the number two the number two for the for done action means okay when envelope is finished simply free the scene and leave space for other calculation oh, sorry Post it on the chat. Okay, so now try to evaluate this description. We don't have any error. We can keep our plot tree window here. What? What? In order to keep track of what is happening now on the server side, let's try to evaluate a synth. You see, now the synth is created and then is fed automatically. I can create many of them. And now the server is taking, uh, is doing all the job for us of freeing the memory. This is quite uh, an important thing to know. It doesn't mean that we, if we don't hear anything, there's actually anything on the server side, of course. It can be the contrary. Let's try another thing. Yes, because we, like before, we can use attack time and release time in a parametric way. Let's say that we want our sound to go from 0 to 1 in a smooth way and then to have a short release so we need to provide not the default argument but two parameters in our percussive attack in our percussive envelope sorry so attack and release will be the word that i'm gonna use and also i want to put them inside the argument list i am providing also some default values now I have an attack of 10 milliseconds and then I have a release of one second. Let's try it. I think nothing is going to change, but if I change the parameters, I want the attack to be, let's say, five seconds and the release to be very short. I can also use the zero to have it very short. So we will hear the sound going up slow in a slow way and then abruptly go to zero. Bam. Okay, cool. Any question about that? Okay. If you want, we can have a little pause now before going on with the last part, which we which uh, we are gonna cover. We're gonna we're gonna try to create a simple sonification from a data set using the thing that we have just seen uh, right now in the practical part. They're gonna see, let's say in five minutes, they're gonna see later. Thank you guys.
Hi guys, welcome back. Now we're gonna try to apply what we have just learned to an actual sonification. It will be very simple, but we are gonna make our uh, first experiment on parameter sonification. I was looking around for dataset to use and I come with this website, which is the NOR website where I was able to find something interesting to me if we go on the web page that, that I've just linked on the chat you can go on this website let me go through those steps I can click on data access and then I want to download the climate at a glance it is a place where I can uh, download data in the uh, tab tabular format I want I think that I have a lot of parameters now but I can simply change this you can see that data are uh, recorded from 1880 till 2021 these are data uh, regarding the surface temperature of the earth and, on, and also of the of the oceans and the one that we are interested in is the global temperature of land and ocean but we can also see a graph of it but we can also download it as a csv i have already downloaded it it is on my folder somewhere let me look for it I think I have it in my data sets. Now let's try to open it with our preferred uh, spreadsheet, let's say, software. This is a CSV, so in order to examine the file, we have to select the comma separation. We can see, we can discard the first lines of this dataset because are simply the description of the dataset. But we have the first column representing the year and then the value. You can see that those are data in a numerical format, in a floating point format. They can be negative and also positive. If we take a look at the description of the data, those are temperature anomalies. Uh, uh, measured on a base period which goes from 191 to 2000. It means that they have taken the median of uh, an entire century and then they are calculating the deviation from this median value. And then we have uh, these uh, values that is moving around the baseline, let's say. The experiment consists in trying to associate and make a parameterization, a mapping, let's say, from those variation data to a particular element of our synthesis machine. So we can use Super Collider, of course, also to load the actual CSV file because we have a class which is called, let me remember it, File Reader, yes file reader let's use a variable to keep track of uh, what we are doing i think the method that we have to call on this class is the method read and then as you see we have to provide a path to our file we can simply drag and drop our data set inside Super Collider in order to turn it in, into a string to be actually used inside uh, the CSV file reader. I think I'm happy with it. Let me take a look at my uh, uh, what I've written before. I have always to use those uh, boolean at the end, but I don't, I'm not quite sure what the meaning of them. Let's try to evaluate this line. Let's first uh, clear the post window for us and let's evaluate this. 
Okay, something interesting is happening here. You see, the post windows is showing us at least part of it, all the data set we have loaded now, etc. etc. is telling us because it's too long for it. Okay, so we can evaluate the letter A because it actually contains the, uh, the, the data. We can also evaluate the size because this is a list of elements we know. We have 146 elements in this list. Uh, because this is a, a list, we can examine one element by one. Let's first examine the element zero at index zero. So you can see that this is an array made of two strings, global, land, and ocean temperatures, and normally January, December. I bet that if I look at the second element, I will have another description field, and so on, till the fourth, no, the, the sixth. Yes, this is the actual first value we are interested in. So we have to remove from the list all the elements we are not interested in. We can simply do it calling the remove at method providing also the index, the element we want to remove. We want to remove the first element in the post window. It will show us the element we are removing. In order to see if we are actually, if it is working, we can evaluate for again the size of the, the array. Now it's 145. Let's remove another element, always at the at beginning of the list. And now the size is decreasing. Yes, we are doing it the correct way. We can remove another element, another one, another one. And I think that we are fine now because let's evaluate the list. I think that we are happy with it because it contains list of two elements, always the years and its respective uh, uh, variation. Okay, cool. But this is not put in the way that we like because we would prefer to have two big lists. The first one of 141, years and the second one with the same amount of element but made by variation we can uh, update our list by using the method which is called flop which is simply uh, uh, aggregating the data according to their position even if they are in different uh, enclosed lists if i do the flop methods now, I can see that the size of our list is made of two elements, which are actually a list of here and a list of values. Any question about that? Is everything clear to you? Okay, let's move on. Let's examine the first value. So I have to make a reference to the second list and then I want to examine the first element in this list. This is minus 0 0.12. Let's take a look at this class because you will find that it is not a number. This is a string because of course we are taking information from a text file. Even if it is a CSV file, it is in the form of a string. So in order to work with that, we have first to convert them in uh, uh, numbers. So if we can use another past, another default variables, but let's say that we are not happy in using the lowercase letter anymore. We can we cannot quite easily understand what those letters uh, contains. We prefer to use our own variable names, or let's say environment uh, element. We we are gonna create them by placing a tilde 
in the beginning and I want to make a variable to keep track of the years. Yes, I know that uh, in Linux and maybe also in Mac it's quite easy to make the tilde, but in Windows I've never been able to understand how it can be done. I'm going to copy it in the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's move on. Now, this is the, the, uh, our environmental variable that we're going to use to keep track of the years. The years are contained inside a zero. So for me, a zero is a conversion, even if you are not going to use it for anything, but I prefer to convert those strings into integer. So now as a check, I can check what the class is. Yes, it is integer. Okay, cool. Now I want to anomalies create another environmental variable with a, which I want to call anomalies in order to do the same exact things for the value array and I want to convert it as a float. Okay, cool. Here we are. Here we are. Okay, so now I'm also interested in finding the, let's say, the maximum and minimum value inside an array. For the moment, I want simply to print it. So, anomalies, I think. I have to use the min item and also the max item in order to find them. Let's see if I evaluate the first line. Oh, okay. I can tell that the, the minimum element in this list is minus 0 0.45 and the maximum one is 0 0.99. It's quite important to do this because we have to know the extension, the range, say, of the data in order to have a proper uh, mapping of the parameter to the sound uh, features later. So, now, let's say that we want to associate to those uh, values. Maybe uh, the simple way that we can think of it is to associate a variation in the frequency of the sound but first of all we have to um, create a way to uh, cycle through the list and maybe for the first time to print one element after the other we can do that by calling a method on a list which is called do so let's do something for every element in this list. As you see, let me make some space for you to better see what I'm doing. Anomalies do. I want, uh, okay, this inside the do is a function. This function is provided by the outside world. Uh, with a value which is the value contained in this exit position of the list because do will gonna cycle through all the elements so we can have an argument which is the element let's say and i want the element to be printed I think that we are happy with it. Let's try to evaluate this. Okay. As you see, the execution was uh, very quick. Everything has been posted quite at the same time. And I have all the values, 141 elements, printed in the post window. Okay, but now I want to have a way to do that in a time-controlled way. So I have to turn this function inside a routine because 
this uh, inside routines that I can control time so I can use let's say I'm happy with the lowercase r for the moment I can call a routine which itself wants a function inside it so we can provide a function inside the routine so let's say that this function is exactly the same thing like we have done before so I can copy and paste it inside the routine I can indent the code in order to better understand as always instead of using the argument word I can use the type I'm more happy with this so let's try to evaluate this code in order to run the routine I can simply press play on it it's not changed like before because we have not added anything in terms of time waiting let's do it let's wait let's say one second before continuing with the cycle so now we're gonna print one element one after the other and wait one second uh, between them so let's evaluate the routine again the routine need to be reset in order to restart from the beginning so let's clear the post window and evaluate this as you see in the post window we are gonna see all the values one after the other one uh, each one of them be post every second now I can I think that I can also call them stop method on the routine in order to stop its execution I can also restart from where I stopped no first restart maybe is the way it's not important for us but ah no error let's keep it for another workshop so let's go on and move on with this let's keep this reset method we are happy with it because we are gonna try many experiments so we have first to uh, we have to use a recipe maybe we can use the recipe that we have already created from the practice before let's make space for this I'm gonna use the same exact envelope sinusoidal uh, wave from before and then we can use this element right here but before doing that we have to find a way to map the values of the anomalies to a value that makes sense in terms of audio we have said that we want to map those values to frequency values so we can do uh, we can add some line of code we can comment this we are not interested in posting the element anymore we want to create a variable this variable can be called frequency and also we can use the element and then we can call a particular method that can be called on every float number and integer number which is called lin lin which stands for do a mapping within with uh, between a linear range to another linear range this method uh, let me see from the documentation lin lin as an abstract function once the minimum value for the input and the maximum value for the input and then you want to know also the minimum for the output and the maximum for the output and then another uh, variable mm, because we maybe we can be interested in also in clipping the value that are exceeding those ranges but for the moment we are happy with what we have 
uh, here. So we have already found a way to understand what is the minimum value of the list, which is min item and also max item. So let's use that inside our function. So let's put them here. First, we need a way to tell linlin -lin what is the minimum value of the input. So this is the minimum item of anomalies. And also we have to provide a way to tell which is the maximum value. Let's make space for it. And then let's say that we want, this is a first try, so we can uh, feel free to experiment as we want. Let's say that we want to move in a range of uh, two octaves, one octave, maybe two is not so great as uh, a range, but now that we have frequency, we can first try to print it, frequency, we can enclose element and frequency inside uh, square brackets and call the post ln methods. We are going to see a list of elements, one after the other. Maybe we can shorten the time between the print. We are not using one second anymore. We can use uh, an eighth of a second. We can evaluate this routine. Let me copy it and paste it in the chat. Yes, of course, in order to do that, you have to uh, you have to have your data set on your PC, but let's try it, let's clear it and let's play the routine. Oh yes, cool. As you see, we have the value on the first column and the frequency, at least a number that can resemble a frequency on the second column. Okay. Let's stop it. Okay, stop it by itself. Let's use now the sync instantiation and we are going to pass it the value of frequency. We are quite happy with our sync description because we have already uh, put inside it a way for the sync to be fed at the end of the envelope. So we can simply use frequency as an argument. We don't need to take a reference to the sync because we are not using it anymore after it has been instantiated so we can simply use the sync method we as usual we are gonna use the sync description definition here our sync was called mtest and now we can also provide parameters directly into the instantiation we want to provide parameters for the frequency so we are gonna we know that the, the argument of the synth is called frequency like we can see here and now we can provide our frequency as a parameter okay it will be very fast quite fast i'm gonna turn up the volume a bit up and then I'm gonna check if my audio is connected to zoom okay I think that we can give it a try Okay, cool. Were you able to hear something? Okay, cool. We have what we have just heard. We have heard something moving from in the range of two of one octave and moving, let's say, from the minimum value, passing through the baseline and going up to the maximum when we have heard the, the octave uh, frequency. 
now this is uh, we have let's say white paper to do a lot of other experimentation I, I mean we probably uh, could not be happy with this because we are not capable of uh, telling what is the ratio between the anomaly and the baseline so maybe we can be interested in playing two sounds at the same time one representing the zero anomalies value and then another sound that is representing the variation of this sound according to this one so we are not create let's say a kind of a melody but we are going to create a chord made of two independent notes a way to do this i can do it in a quick way because I'm going to use what I have just prepared. First of all, I want to see if my code makes sense still now because I made it quite some time ago. Now I've made some different ranging here because well, let's say that we want to keep what we have used now. I'm going to explain it very briefly now. So, I'm interested in having a reference to the baseline frequency. So, baseline prep here. And I can obtain this by mapping the zero anomaly value. Tell me if it doesn't make sense to you. I can map, I can find the way this value, which is zero, is mapped in the frequency range according to the initial range, which is going from minus 0 0.45 and 0 0.99. This baseline frequency, what's its value, is 577.5. Okay, cool. So we can instantiate two things here. Let's make this example. I want to use always the same description like before, but instead of playing it with a parametric frequency, I'm gonna play it with a fixed frequency. So we are gonna hear it staying at the same place and maybe crashing and clashing with the other sound. Let's make a test. Maybe to have, I don't know if, I think that it will not help us to uh, understand the ratio of these two frequency together, but we can pan the first one to the left and the second one to the right. We can also play with the uh, attack time and release time in order to differentiate them according to what we have learned before uh, in terms of physical parameters, but especially from the perceptual point of view because we are able to distinguish sound according to the position we can quite uh, tell that if we are gonna use different panning we also are gonna better discriminate between those two sounds and maybe we can also be uh, good at finding what is the movement of one according to the other i think that also we are gonna have different attack and release time but it is a, only a first try less let's hear to this Okay, guys, this can be told as a, our first experiment we made together in our uh, sonification journey we, we had today. Oh, yes, of course. I'm going to 
copy and paste it inside the chat Yes, of course, we can also add, let me show you maybe some other experiment I have made just before starting this workshop. I have used the a techniques, a synthesis techniques, which is called FM synthesis. And I have created another description right here. Uh, we can, I have always used the envelope uh, percussive as we have already seen. And also, I'm using a sin, uh, sinusoidal oscillator uh, whose frequency is added and multiplied, maybe with another one which is called the modulator. The experiment is to I want to create a sound that is uh, more and more different from a sinusoidal one. Uh, according to the absolute value of the variation. So if the variation is bigger, I will hear a, a sound that is quite uh, different from the sinusoidal one. So let's try to instantiate an FM sync with a modulation index of zero. No problem if you're not following me anymore now, right now. Those are, let's say, some advanced topics. Don't know how to call them. But now we are hearing to a simple sign with a percussive envelope. Now we are hearing something which is different. Is what is created the same with the uh, FM synthesis techniques, and we are gonna play with those values. I have to uh, keep track of the anomalies array, but I want the absolute values of those anomalies so i'm creating a new list where i'm going to collect all those anomalies uh, in a positive side of the axis and then i want to find the max item so now we are going to move uh, from 0 to 1 let's say 0 0.99 so let me see what i've written okay now we have the same routine as before and now we are cycling through all those anomalies we are changing the attack time because we are taking the absolute value this is what we have previously called element value now is calculated in terms of absolute value and then we are mapping this from zero to the max item of the absolute anomalies and then we are gonna move the attack time from 0 0.01 to 100 milliseconds, something similar to the release time. We are also modifying the modulation index the same way from a very small one to a big one. And then we are also, let me see here. Okay, now we are also uh, tuning those synthesizer on two different frequencies places on different octaves according to the value if the value is below zero so the anomaly is in the negative side of the axis we are going to use the two 220 hertz if the value is greater than zero we are going to use the octave above i'm going to pass all these values to the synth and as, as you can see, now we are going to create a one-to-many mappings functions when a value is mapped to many synthesizing parameters. I think that this is quite much more meaningful than the, the example before because we are mapping more than one parameter which in, a, in terms of perceptive uh, uh, the way we are, we are listening sound from a perceptive point of view we are doing a better job now but 
as I told you, this is only the beginning. You can also try to map to other stuff. You can also try different synthesizing techniques. You can also, let's say, play with samples instead of uh, synthesize your uh, to create your own synthesizer. You can, let's say, you have an audio file that in some sort of way well represent the way temperature is moving. You don't know what kind of sound this could be. Maybe a sound of don't know fire crackling or something like that. You can place it and use it to create a different uh, a different uh, mapping. You can also play with time. What about if I change this value, which is the weight uh, number that we, we are waiting from one value to the other? What about if I change it in a parametric way? So when the anomalies grows a lot, I have those rhythmical accents more uh, close together. And then if the anomalies goes below zero, I have them more relaxed. I can do a lot of stuff with this. So, any question about that? Is always clear to you? So guys, I think that we have we, we have done and let me spend some few words words on those references i think that we are going to share with you this presentation in form of a pdf file so we are going to have all of these references we can look here at books people we have a lot of we have a lot of them we also have talked about them some of them some different links i have found in doing research for this workshop and not only i also have put some references to places where you can find um, creative commons uh, samples audio files you can use in your sonification and also a musical library where you can find uh, sounds let's say this same San Martino symphonic orchestra for example is a full orchestra sampling which is uh, free in terms that is free software so you can use it for free without asking permission to anyone with this is a cool uh, project uh, from this symphonic orchestra and then other references can be those instruments maybe some of this is uh, already known by some of you because these are related to database but also i've put something that i found uh, uh, related to the sonification uh, i also recommend to follow us on instagram facebook and linkedin to stay updated because we have another workshop to come which is the last on the uh, on the series which is i think uh, is it correct the, the, the time I've written here? Okay, cool. So guys, I want to thank you all for being here with us. And if you have any questions about what we have seen, please let me know. We have some time in fact to, to talk about something that maybe cannot have been so clear. Yes, of course, Super Collider is a very huge and powerful tool. There's a lot of stuff inside it. And, uh, uh, but over there is plenty of very good resources to start uh, digging in it. I encourage you to look at the Ellie Field Steel YouTube channel, which is quite good to me. I started, uh, me too, I've started with it. And also, uh, from the community let's say they are very uh, fine people it's very good to go over there and uh, nobody is shaming at you because you're placing new by questions like in maybe many other places <laughs> it's quite interesting to me
So of course, if you find yourself uh, playing around with Super Collider in the next days, next month, feel free to contact us and ask for uh, everything. We'll let us know what you are doing with data, with data sonification. Let us know what are your the thing you are struggle with, you are struggling with, and so on. It was a pleasure. Let's see you. Again. Thanks a lot. That was fun. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> so, bye bye. Bye. Have a good See you one. Next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Nicola, sorry. Me. Uh, can I ask you something? I had the, the microphone shut down. Uh, okay. When you do like at the exhibition where you have a sound and visual related, yes. um, you have a super collider, and then uh, uh, what other program do you use for the visual? Yes, of course. We uh, we have here uh, many people in our staff that are quite good at using uh, BBVV, 4V, they call it, yes. Uh, thank you, Cristiano. And uh, we uh, use V4, V4 and Super Collider in tandem. Uh, there are sometimes two software running on the same machine, exchanging messages, uh, the uh, the OSC protocol, which is the same protocol that Super Collider is using itself inside it uh, for uh, communicate uh, between client and server. And we are going to use OSC to send messages between V4 and the Super Collider. Sometimes, like in the case of Mac, the museum that I told you before in Lisbon, I directly used OSC coming from Arduino going straight forward to Super Collider uh, in order to have a faster response in terms of uh, moving moving a control and then listening to the actual sound that is produced by Super Collider. But yes, to answer your question, V4. Okay, cool. Very cool. It can be anything because uh, all the software that are all around now are talking OSC very fluently, so you can use. Uh, you can also use if you want a c many instances of the c uh, Super Collider synthesizer and maybe a single client talking to all of them on the net, or the contrary, where you have a single server and many clients talking all together to the single server. Okay, cool. Thank you a lot. Thank you to you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you.